Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Father, bless your word to us this morning. We're grateful for the opportunity to come and to hear from you again. So speak to us, Lord. We are listening to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we come to Acts chapter 13, we come to another one of those great turning points in the book of Acts. If you remember, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he spoke to his disciples and he said that I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. And in the first 12 chapters of Acts that we've seen so far, we've seen it in Jerusalem, we've seen it in Judea, we've seen it in Samaria, and we've seen it just sort of start edging out into the uttermost parts of the earth. But now with chapter 13, something brand new begins, something amazing. Let, let's just jump into it. Verse 1 right here, Acts 13, 1. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, we saw in Acts chapters 11 and 12, excuse me, 10 and 12, we saw the amazing work that God was doing there in Antioch. How in the midst of this pagan city, God started a church there that was just having an incredible impact on its community and beyond. It was sort of the first vibrant living church that came from a truly pagan community. Now, we also saw at the very end of Acts chapter 12 that Saul and Barnabas were among the teachers and prophets who were there, as well as we learn in this verse, a man named Simeon, a man named Lucius, and a man named Manaen. It's kind of interesting to see the diversity of the people that were there. There are people from different races. For example, this man Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, since Niger means black, he was probably a black African man from the north area of Africa. And there was a mixed people, a mixed group, a mixed congregation there, which is of no surprise, because that's the kind of community that Antioch was. They weren't saying, well, we're just going to focus on a certain kind of people in Antioch. No, they said, listen, let's reach our whole community, and that sort of diversity, that sort of cosmopolitan character that the city of Antioch was reflected in the congregation itself. There's one guy kind of interesting there, if you notice there, verse 1, that mentions this fellow named Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. You see, Herod was one of the great evil rulers. He's the guy that was responsible for the beheading of John the Baptist. He's the guy who presided over one of Jesus' trials before Jesus went to the cross. And this fellow, Manaen, had been brought up in the same aristocratic, sort of uh, privileged environment that this man inherited. He was a friend, an associate of his from his youth. Really kind of interesting to think, isn't it? These two young men grew up together, Manaen and Herod, one of them turned out to be a wicked king who murdered God's prophets and helped send Jesus to the cross, and another one of them grew up. They became an outstanding Christian, one of the amazing churches of the early world, and he was a man who really influenced the world for Jesus Christ. It's interesting to see how those paths go, right? I bet there's stories like that in your life, right? People you grew up with, and some turned one way, you've turned another way, or maybe you're here this morning, you may be the one who's turned the wrong way, right? Well, it's not too late for you to turn back and to turn your heart to the Lord right here, right now, today. It's interesting to see how those different paths go. Anyway, now look at verse 2. It says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Is that an interesting idea there in verse 2? It says, as they ministered to the Lord. You see, that's just part of what happened at the congregation there in Antioch. Uh, Barnabas and Saul and others, they were certainly ministering to the congregation, but here the congregation as a whole was also ministering to the Lord. Friends, do you ever think that way when you come to the church? M maybe you come to church and you think the idea is you're here to be a spectator, and ministry happens up on the platform and kind of comes from the platform to you. Now, the people up here on the platform, they do want to minister to you. They do want to serve you. They want to bless you. No doubt about it. And there definitely is that aspect. I'm not trying to deny that. 
But do you understand that when you come here as a congregation on a Sunday or Wednesday or whenever it might be, you're supposed to be doing some ministry. And you know who you're supposed to be ministering to? Well, obviously you're supposed to be ministering to one another. You're supposed to have an eye out for one another and love them and care for them. Do you understand that? You, you, you see faces here at church on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night, and you see faces and you can look in their eyes and you can tell not everything's right with that person, right? You know what that's like. Do, do you understand that when you see that, that's a ministry opportunity for you? You could be so bold to actually say, Fred, can I pray for you? Introduce yourself to them, have them introduce yourself. Just, and just, anyway, you can minister one to another. But you can also do that wonderful thing that's spoken here right in Acts chapter 13, verse 2. You can minister unto the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? You can serve God here. How do you do it? I think there's two very significant ways you do it. You do it, number one, through your worship, through your praise. This word, ministered unto the Lord, it's actually a word that's used in the context of priestly service. And the Bible says that we bring a sacrifice of praise to God. In the Old Testament, they wanted to praise God. Oftentimes, they would do it with an animal sacrifice. We don't bring animal sacrifices under the New Covenant, but we do bring a sacrifice of praise. And when you're here together with this environment where with the music and with the singing, we're worshiping God, you can sing those as prayers and praise to God. And with your whole heart, you are bringing a sacrifice of praise to him. And it's precious in his sight. God loves that. God's honored by that. Do you understand that you can come here and bless and honor God with who you are and what you do before him? Now, I also believe that right now you're ministering unto the Lord. Right now you're blessing him as you sit and you receive and you listen to his word and its application to your life. I think that honors God as well. So here they are in the congregation of Antioch. They're ministering unto the Lord. By the way, if I could just say one more thing about that. That is the first job of any servant of God. If you want to serve God, if you want to honor him with, his, with your life, the first thing you need to do is to be able to minister unto him. There's too many pastors. They, they, they serve the people to the best of their ability, but they're not ministering unto the Lord. Their, their horizontal connections are strong, or at least as strong as they can make them, but their vertical connection with the Lord, it gets strained, it gets stretched. No, 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 we want to minister unto the Lord, and that's exactly what they were doing there in Antioch. And part of their ministry unto the Lord, it says right there in verse 2, was that they were fasting. This was a reflection of their dedication. Man, they were serious about it. But notice it right here. It also says in verse 2 that as they were ministering unto the Lord, the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit spoke to them as they were doing this. And I don't know what it was like. Maybe it was a time of worship. Maybe it was a time of waiting on the Lord. Maybe they were in the midst of, of a meeting and a prophet spoke out because in the first verse we hear there's prophets there at Antioch. But there they are. There's ministering to God and God spoke to them. And what God spoke to them was a word of calling that would impact that entire congregation, but most pointedly, Barnabas and Saul. He said, I'm calling Barnabas and Saul to do a specific work. Now, can I say something? There's no indication here that they heard an audible voice of God. It could have been through a prophecy. It could have been through a vision. It could have been through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how it was exactly, but the Holy Spirit spoke to them. I want to emphasize, there's no indication that they heard an audible voice. Friends, don't get caught in the trap of straining to hear an audible voice from God. Because when you do that, you put yourself in a very dangerous position. You put yourself in this thing where you can manufacture a voice in your head. And that's a very scary thing. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about this. If I could read you this quote. He said, I do not for a moment imagine that the assembly heard a voice. That is the mistake that we too often make. We try to force ourselves into ecstasies in order to hear the voice. Then we imagine that we hear it. Friends, don't get caught in that trap. Don't strain to hear an audible voice to God. But in whatever way it was that God spoke to them, what did he say? He said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul to the work for which I have called them. 
they had to be separated unto God. In other words, Barnabas and Saul, here you are, you're very fruitful, you're serving as teachers, you're serving as preachers right there in the congregation at Antioch, and you're doing a wonderful work, but God is saying, I want you to separate yourselves in a special way unto me because I really have a work to do for you. By the way, that whole idea that they had to be separate to God. You'll never serve God the way God wants you to unless you separate yourself from some things. You can't truly be separated unto God unless you're also separated from some other things. You can't really say yes to God's call on your life unless you're also willing to say no to some other things in your life, right? You, you can't say yes to everything. You can only say yes to God's call if you're also willing to say no to some other things, the things that would keep you from that call. So here they were listening to it. They said, separate to me Saul and Barnabas for the work. By the way, can I just say, isn't it significant that seemingly the two most prominent teachers at the church at Antioch were Barnabas and Saul? And God said, those are the guys. I could see the congregation objecting to that very greatly. Are you kidding me? Send somebody else. We love having Barnabas and Saul here, no doubt about it. But God said, no, no, no. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul. And he said, when to do it? Now. Did you notice that in verse 2? Look at it again. Now separate to me. God gave a timetable now. Before God had uh, told Paul through Ananias that his calling would be to the nations, but not that it was now. Now they were hearing that it was the time to do it. And so this is what they did. Look at it. It's right next verse, verse 3. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. Can you imagine what a tearful occasion that was? Can you imagine they all gathered together, the tears are flowing, Barnabas and Saul, we love these guys. No, they shouldn't be going, but no, they're going to go away at least for a time, and they're going to go spread the gospel to these other places. And so they laid their hands, and then they fasted, they prayed, they, they were sent out with that substantial dependence upon God. God, we're depending on you. Our demonstration of our dependence is shown in our prayer, is shown in our fasting. And then they laid hands on them. This was some sort of formal commissioning, a point of connection. These men are called these men to ordain to this work we lay our hands on them in recognition of it and then it says right there in verse 3 that they sent them away I want you to notice something that the church in Antioch sent Barnabas and Saul out not everybody who goes out from a church to do ministry is sent I heard one pastor say it this way some people are sent and some people just went <laughs> but these were sent these were commissioned by the congregation. They had people behind them in Antioch saying, listen, we're behind you. We're going to support you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to think about you. You are representing us out in the world and go out and do this. And friends, I want you to know that as far as we know, this had never happened before in the history of Christianity. You see, there were before many people who went out at accidental missionaries, right? When persecution began at Jerusalem, there were a lot of accidental missionaries from that, right? And their theme was not, we're going to go to the nations and preach the gospel. The theme was, run for your lives. But as they ran for their lives, they preached the gospel in these other places that they went, right? But here it's something completely different. Here it's the intentional sending of people out to go and preach the gospel and to plant churches. There was never a concerted, a never organized effort like this before to win people to Jesus. Now, being intentionally sent by the church in Antioch, many people regard this as the first known missionary effort of the church. Do you know what the word missionary even means? It comes from the Latin word that means to be sent. James Montgomery Boyce says this. He says the word missionary has to do with sending. The Latin word mito or mitere means to send, and mission and missionary come from the forms missi and missium. It all comes from the Latin word meaning to send. That's what a missionary is. It's someone who's sent. Someone sent to go out and to do this work on behalf of a congregation or on behalf of a group someplace else, and they just went. Now, can I say this without, without sounding judging or commend, uh, condemning towards anybody else, but I'll just say it. They must have done this without a committee report. They did it without a demographic analysis. They did it without a marketing survey. They did it without spiritual mapping. 
Barnabas and Saul did it without any of these things. They only went out with the call and the power of God. Now, I'm not saying that those things have no use in God's work. I don't mean to imply that at all. And sort of from the snide way I said that, you might have thought I meant that. But I don't. Those things can have a purpose in God's plan. But listen, listen. God can work outside of them and around them, right? And these men simply went out in the call and the authority of the Holy Spirit, and they went, can you just imagine what that was like? They're so excited to go, we're actually going to go out. We're going to do this. We're just going to go out and preach the gospel and let the Holy Spirit lead us, and we're just going to do it. And so they go, first stop, verse 4, a city called Seleucia. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now we're going to do a little bit of map work here, right? They start in the city of Antioch, right? They start in Antioch, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Now notice this. Sent out by the Holy Spirit. Did you notice what a change it was? Just in the previous verse, it was said that the church sent them out, right? Now in verse 4 we read that the Holy Spirit sent them out. Which one was it? And the answer is, yes. It was both of them, was it not? They were sent out by the church. They were also sent out by the Holy Spirit. But let me say this. A church can send somebody out, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't send them out, it really doesn't matter, does it? And there have been some people, some people close to us, some people notable in the history of Christianity, for whatever reason, churches wouldn't support them. God's people never had their vision, their passion, their call. Maybe they thought they were too daring, too audacious, too unprepared, but they just went out. But the Holy Spirit of God was with them. And so there's some occasions like that. But these, we had the glorious position of being sent out by the Holy Spirit and by the church. And then it says right there in verse 4 that they went down to Seleucia. So here's our map work. We start now starting out with the city of Antioch. That's north of Jerusalem, some 300 miles. So there's Antioch. And then they went a very short distance to Seleucia. Not far at all. Seleucia is right on the course. Antioch was a little bit inland, oh, 20 miles or so. So they just went a short distance out to the coast. But that was stop number one. Now you say, well, so what? It doesn't take about them doing any ministry there. They're not doing preaching the gospel. I'm sure they did something, but there's nothing really notable there. I don't know. I just think that they were so excited about going that they marked their first trip, right? It's like if you were going somewhere for the very first time and you said, and first we went to the airport. Well, okay, so what? But no, you're excited about it, right? So it's meaningful to you. So first they go to the harbor city of Seleucia, but then starting with verse 5, that's where it really starts getting interesting. It says, And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Did you see that in verse 5? First of all, it says, when they arrived in Salamis, they got on a boat in Seleucia and they sailed across the waters to the island of Cyprus and they went to a city called Salamis. Now, why did they go to Cyprus first? Why there? I mean, listen, they got the whole Roman Empire to choose from. Why go to Cyprus first? You know, we have no idea. I'll give you a suggestion. We know from previously in the book of Acts that Barnabas was from Cyprus. That's where he was from. So can you see Barnabas and Saul? They're there at Salamis there, or Seleucia, I should say, and they're getting ready to get on a boat. Well, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. I know some people in Cyprus. They need the gospel. Okay, let's go there. They go across the water to the city of Salamis. They go there, and what does it say in verse 5? They preached the word of God in the synagogues. Now, I'll talk about this more because we're going to see this a lot in the book of Acts. But there was a custom in that day that was extremely advantageous. Please understand, these two men, Saul and Barnabas, were notable in the Jewish world. Saul was a rabbi, a student of a great rabbi named Gamaliel. Saul was almost certainly a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a man with a lot of credentials. And those people wore a little special robe, a little special accoutrement to their you know, clothing. People could tell, wow, this is a heavy guy. He just walked in here. Not exactly the same, but if a guy walked in with a great big ministerial collar, right? But something like that, but not exactly the same. He walk in the synagogue and people would know, well, wow, he's important. 
And Barnabas was a Levite. He had this background. You know, they had a presence about him. Well, at that time in Judaism, they had what they called the custom of the courtesy of the synagogue, which simply meant this. When they went into a synagogue, they were often invited to speak. The man who presided over the synagogue would look over and he'd see if there were any visitors. And if there was a notable visitor among them, a guy like, you know, Saul or Barnabas, he would say, well, brother, here, I see you're visiting with us this morning. Is there anything you would like to share with our synagogue congregation this morning? And Saul would say, well, I'm so pleased that you asked me. And he'd get up and he would preach Jesus to them. Friends, this happened in synagogue after synagogue all over the Roman world. I can just imagine Saul walking in there. Watch this, Barnabas. They're going to ask me again. <laughs> I, I got in bed. Saul would ask, surprise, really? You want to ask me to come up and preach? Well, and he would, and he would share, and they did it over and over again. So that's what it means. We're going to see this repeatedly in the book of Acts. But verse 5 says, they preached the word of God in the synagogues, and they also had John as their assistant. Now, I need to unravel a little something for you. This John that was with them was not the Apostle John. This was the John who was also known as John Mark. We'll meet up with him again later. Just hold on. We're going to talk more about him. But this is the same Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. And he went with them. Matter of fact, he was probably a very valued companion for these two. Because John Mark lived in Jerusalem and was a young man during the time that Jesus was doing his ministry. He probably heard Jesus teach and was interacting with his ministry in a way that these other guys probably were not. You, you could see John Mark was there and he said, yes, and I saw Jesus. And let me tell you what he said. And before the, the written records were very well established or published abroad, John Mark was a very valuable eyewitness to have with them. So that's what they did in Salamis. Now, we don't read much of what happened in Salamis, right? Verse 5, look at it again. Does anybody read, and 5,000 people confess Jesus as Lord that day? No. Matter of fact, we're not told of a single result that happened there in Salamis. Maybe there were, maybe there weren't. But listen, that's how it is when you preach the gospel. Can I free you with something here this morning? There are some of you who think that it's your responsibility to bring people to Jesus Christ. It's your responsibility to convert them. Listen. Please don't go out converting people. If you've converted them, mm, that's a tough, tough thing. Well, you heard the old story. It's a great preacher story, and as far as I know, it's true. There was a man who was a very drunken man, and he stumbled into a church where Billy Graham was preaching, and the man was just sort of, you know, drunken and out of order. And when he got to meet Billy Graham, when he saw him, he said, Oh, you're Billy Graham. Well, you converted me 10 years ago. And Billy Graham said, well, I suppose that's true, because it's certainly evident you're not one of Jesus' converts. <laughs> Listen, the idea is it's not our responsibility to convert people, right? It's our responsibility to deliver the message. And we don't know what the results were in Salamis. I, I don't want to say that they were bad. We're just not told. But we are told that they faithfully delivered the message. Friends, Free yourself from the responsibility of having to convert anybody. You can't do it, and if you could, you and I, we'd probably mess it up some way, wouldn't we? But Jesus can convert them when we tell them the glorious message. So that was Salamis. Next stop, look at verse 6 here. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Okay, so notice next, on our map work here, they were on the east coast of the island of Cyprus in Salamis. Now they go across the island to the west coast. I don't know if they went over land. They might have sailed a ship. I don't really know. But they go over to the west coast, and they come over to the city of Paphos. And there in Paphos, by the way, I've got a friend in Paphos, a, a man named Tim and his wife Darlene. They have a church, a Calvary Chapel church, right there in Paphos today. It's really a wonderful thing to connect this with the biblical places. Anyway, they, they're just building on the work of the Apostle Paul there, right? Because there they go around to Paphos on the west coast of Cyprus, and that city was known for its immorality and spiritual darkness. There they were in the midst of this place that was pagan, 
that was known for its immorality. It was a popular vacation spot. It was known for that sort of, you know, Las Vegas, loose vacation living kind of immorality. And when they're in the midst of that city, somehow, we don't know how it happened, they met the man who was the proconsul of the island of Cyprus. His name was Sergius Paulus. He was a very important man. A proconsul was in, responsible for the entire province, and he answered to the Roman Senate. Matter of fact, an archaeologist, Sir William Ramsey, he reports that there's inscriptions bearing the name of Sergius Paulus found on Cyprus and confirming that he was a Christian and that his whole family became Christians. Well, anyway, this man, it says right there, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So I don't know what they were doing in Paphos. Maybe they were preaching in the synagogues as they had opportunity. Who knows? Maybe they were just talking to people on the street. However they did it, they presented Jesus and an unexpected door opened. The proconsul, this very important man, like the governor of the province, he wanted to hear the word of God. Isn't that exciting when God opens doors like that? But there was a problem, right? There was a problem this fellow named, in the previous verse, Bar-Jesus. We're going to pick him up here in verse 8. Check it out. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. First of all, I just like this. Did you see what Luke called him back in verse 6? He called him Bar-Jesus. That was his name. Listen, Jesus was not, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, Jesus was not a terribly unique name in the first century. There were a lot of people named Jesus. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior and Lord, the man who won our redemption on the cross, he didn't have like this amazingly unique name. You know, his name was just something normal. There were a lot of Jesuses in the first century. So this man had a, not an unusual name, Bar Jesus, in other words, son of Jesus. His father's name was Jesus, and that was the name of this man who was causing trouble for them in Paphos. But what's funny about that, if you look at verse 8, Luke calls him Elimus. You know what it was? Luke couldn't stand to call this guy Bar-Jesus. I'm not calling him Bar-Jesus, Luke says. I'll let you know that that's what his name was, but I'm not calling this guy Son of Jesus because he was no Son of Jesus that I know. So I'll call him Elimus. Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated. Now, this man named Elimus, again, he was some kind of advisor to the proconsul, and he was attempting to frustrate the missionary efforts of Barnabas and Saul. And that must have really got under Saul's skin, because look at verse 9. It says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looking intently at him, and said, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? That's what we call a confrontation, isn't it? <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm so happy that Luke cleared it up for us in verse 9, right? Did you see that? Saul, who was also called Paul. In that day, in those cultures, it was very common for people to have names that were similar yet different according to the language or the culture that they were in. So Saul of Tarsus, his given name was Saul. He was a Jewish man. He was named after the first king of Israel. Saul was his given name. When his father said, Saul, Saul, come home for dinner, that's exactly what he called him, Saul after the first king of Israel. But since he was also a Roman citizen and grew up uh, in Tarsus, grew up in this place that had a Roman population all around it, people also called him Paul. His father would say, Saul, come home for dinner. His Roman playmates that he was playing with, they would call him Paul, Paul. The name Paul means little. Not this great, grandiose name, right? I don't know if it's the same as calling somebody shorty or something, but they called him little, Paul. Here he is, Paul. So listen, please understand this. When we were talking about Saul, now we're going to start talking about Paul, and we mean the same guy, right? Same guy with two different names from two different cultures. And what did he do? You saw it right there in verse 10. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked at him and he said, Oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Paul used some spiritual discernment 
He knew this man was bound up by the devil, and using the gift of faith, he rebuked the man, and he pronounced the judgment of God upon him, and he said, you shall be blind. That's pretty bold stuff, isn't it? I've heard of that kind of stuff happening today. I'll tell you a story. I won't, you know, give you the names or anything, because it's certainly not my story. I heard it secondhand, but I heard it from reliable sources. A very prominent, well-known pastor, his church was being protested and picketed by just some angry people. Now, this was many years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago. Just being protested and picketed and some angry, hateful people. And the pastor's wife didn't take too kindly to it. So the pastor's wife went up to one of the, you know, the meanest and the, the foulest of the protesters, and she said this to the man. She said, I curse you in Jesus' name until you repent. And she walked away. Well, you know, the man didn't think much of it. Ha, 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 lady, curse me. By the end of the week, he had called the church office and he said something like this. Can you get that pastor's wife to take back that curse? My life has been a mess for the past week and I want to repent. <laughs> now listen, I don't know, that, that's pretty bold stuff to do. I've never done such a thing. I didn't think of doing such a thing. But something right along, sort of along the lines of what Paul did. Now, can I say something? Why would Paul do such a thing? Why would Paul be so bold to rebuke this man and call him son of the devil? By the way, it's interesting. His name bar Jesus, son of Jesus. It's as if Paul was saying this. You're no son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil. Why would Paul be so bound up? Why would Paul strike him with blindness? By the way, I think that was very meaningful. Because you remember what happened to Saul at his conversion, right? He was struck with blindness. And it's almost as if Saul could see himself in that man. You know, you, you, you're, you're bitterly rejecting Jesus. You're trying to prevent other people to come to Jesus Christ. I used to be the same way. God struck me with some blindness, and it did me some good. You be struck with blindness. Maybe there's something like that going on. Maybe it was all this compassionate impulse. It, listen, it did me some good. Maybe it'll do you some good. But he pronounced this, and he just say, why? Why would he do it in such a severe way? Well, I'll tell you why he would do it. Because this man, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, his soul was at stake. Look at what happens here, verse 11. It says, And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went away, uh, went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. Yeah, I bet he did. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The proconsul believed. Now this helps explain why Paul was so angry with Elimus. Because he was standing in the way of another man coming to Jesus. I'm going to speak very straightforwardly to you here now. I, I have to say, I'm so blessed by the graciousness of this congregation where you allow me to speak to you very straightforwardly, very pointedly. I, I don't take that for granted. And so I'll, I'll presume upon that again. Friend, if you want to commit spiritual suicide, that's one thing. But how dare you drag somebody else down to hell with you? If you want to say, no, Jesus isn't for me. I'm not going to put my trust in him. I just can't believe it. I won't believe it. I choose not to believe. Whatever you say, okay, listen, I, I, I would love to wrestle with you. I'd love to persuade you. But at the end of it all, you say, I'll commit spiritual suicide, then that's your choice. But friend, please, please don't block the way for anybody else who wants to come to Jesus. You are heaping guilt and condemnation upon yourself far beyond what you could ever imagine. Jesus gave a very grave warning about those who would cause any of his little ones to stumble. So don't you be one of those ones. Matter of fact, if you would have any compassion, any mercy upon these other people with whom you would not want to be an obstacle to their coming to Jesus, can you not simply apply the same thing to yourself and say, I should come to Jesus myself? These are very severe words. And some of the most severe words in the Bible are reserved for those who stand in the way. They're obstacles to other people coming to Jesus Christ. 
Don't you be one of them. Well, Paul got the obstacle out of the way. He did it in a dramatic way. He did it in a way I've never done. I don't ever anticipate doing such a thing. But he did it, right? I would suppose, I would hope that if the Lord would call upon me and give me the gift of faith and discernment to do it, I would have the same boldness that Paul did. But it hasn't happened yet to call down such a curse upon somebody. But I'm very passionate about saying to other people and saying to you, as I just said, don't be an obstacle to other people coming to Jesus. With that obstacle out of the way, again, verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done. Now, he saw something in Paul, right? He saw the courage of Paul. He understood something right then. Listen, I don't know this man, Paul. Uh, uh, his message seems to make some sense. But, but this man, Paul, he knows my soul is worth fighting for. My soul is worth battling for. And I'm honored that a man would battle for my soul. And I'll say it right now, that, that if nobody else will battle for your soul, I'll do it right now. If nobody else will pray for you, I'll pray for you now. You should know that somebody cares about your eternal soul before God. Actually, the room right here is filled with people who care. So that's the one thing he saw. He saw the courage and the concern of Paul, but he also saw the just result of Elimus' sin, that, that physical blindness that corresponded to his spiritual blindness. Listen, I see the trouble this brought Elimus into. I don't want the same trouble. I will separate myself from that sin. But notice this at the very end of verse 12. Did you notice this? It says, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I think that's amazing, don't you? It doesn't tell us that he was astonished at the sudden blindness of Elimus. It doesn't tell us that he was astonished at Paul's... I think those things impressed him, right? They must have had some effect upon him. But what astonished him was the teaching of the Lord presumably the doctrines of God's gracious gift to man in Jesus Christ. So let me astonish you right now. Jesus Christ died on a cross to win the forgiveness for your sins. And I'm not just speaking right now to those who haven't yet come to Jesus or surrendered their lives to him. I'm speaking to you, believers, my, my blessed brothers and sisters in the family of God. You've sinned this week, haven't you? If you haven't sinned this week, please come up and preach a second service. We need, we need a better preacher than me up here. You've sinned. You need the forgiveness of God this week, don't you? You need the forgiveness of God today, don't you? You need to hear those comforting words from your Lord. I won your forgiveness. My love is richly poured out upon you, not because you deserve it, but because my son purchased it for you because of what he did on the cross. That's for everybody in this room. And so you stop trying to earn the love of God. You stop trying to deserve his grace, and you receive it freely looking to Jesus, who he is and what he did for you on the cross. That's for each of us, is it not? And so now we say, yes, Lord, we are also astonished at that teaching. And being astonished at it, we believe it and we receive it. Is that you now? Then let's pray together to that effect. Father, I pray that you'd astonish us all over again with who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross. And Lord, I want to pray in particular for those this morning who have not yet received him. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak to their hearts now that you would challenge them, not only, Lord, to, to stop being an obstacle to others, but, Lord, to receive Jesus for themselves. Lord, speak to their hearts right now.